Hello, my name is Mark Fisher. I am the person who writes about XTC from my days making the XTC fanzine Limelight to more recent times doing the books uh, What Do You Call That Noise, an XTC discovery book and XTC bumper book of fun. Uh, and we're here to talk about, I'm going to introduce the people I'm with, but we're here to talk about Garden of Earthly Delights, an XTC celebration which is a compilation that is imminently out on Future Man Records. And to help me do that, I have two uh, profound and wise uh, gentlemen of pop, uh, David White Hello. And, and, and Mark Reed. And maybe, uh, well, I'll start with you, David. You, you could maybe say just a little bit about two things, actually, I'm interested. One, that you have, been, you have done your own covers yourself. And you could say something about those, but also then also you, your contribution to um, what do you call that noise is relevant in this case. Um, who are you? Sure, yeah, I, well, I, I was an XTC fan since I heard Runaways in 1982. And uh, after that, uh, my friend Hugh and I, um, we uh, formed a, a band to play at the uh, Manchester XTC convention. We were called Balloon, <clears throat> and uh, we did Seagull Screaming Kisser Kisser and... Uh, um, uh, pulsing, pulsing, uh, among others, uh, all great fun. And uh, I wrote about the experience in your book, Mark, um, uh, just a year ago. Um, and uh, I was uh, very interested to look into uh, what bands around the world are doing um, in uh, doing their covers on stage uh, of XTC songs. It's all part of uh, maintaining the legacy. Great. And um, m uh, Mark, you you're an XUC fan. You're currently wearing, for, for those who are not, uh, don't have multicoloured uh, uh, podcast uh, visuals, uh, currently wearing a Dukes of Stratosphere uh, uh, T-shirt. You're, you're a long-term XTC fan. Yeah, I, I didn't know this T-shirt was available until I saw on a, your Facebook page um, someone saying they got one for Christmas. And so I went on and there it was, nice bright Prince Purple, so I got one. But yeah, the, um, the first XTC um, record I heard was back in the early days when Small Wonder would advertise on the back of the NME and literally all the punk new wave singles were listed there. There might be a dozen a week released of that. And so myself and two friends would kind of split them up between us and we'd all sort of between us buy most of them. And one of my friends obviously got the XTC one, I didn't. Uh, but that was my first introduction and then it kind of from there onwards. So I, I didn't actually get the first albums at the time, uh, much by regret. Because they were sort of ubiquitous, they were kind of mm -hmm. always there in your doors. In those days, there was limited runs, so you kind of go for the stuff that you didn't think was going to be there next week. Whereas, like, go to and that sort of thing was always sat in the racks because it was major label stuff. So you'd go for the smaller label stuff, but uh, I caught up in time. Very good. And yeah. let's just talk in general before we we we, we talk in specific about um, Garden of Earthly Delights because this is now but the Garden of Earthly Delights is a, a compilation of if you get the digital download as well as the two double CD set you actually get up to I think it's forty nine songs. So uh, this this is um, an awful lot of XTC covers here. What do you think in general? Forget about XTC, but what do you think in general about um, covers? But Mark, you were just saying that uh, has there ever been a good covers album? Yeah, that's as you know, friend Gordon Leg. Uh, Day and asked him because I was racking my brain. I was thinking there must be a thing. Sure, Bowie did one, or there must be something. But I always remembered um, Kate Bush. Well, sorry, there was a Elton John covers album um, about twenty odd years ago, and Kate Bush did Rocketman. Mm -hmm. And at the time, someone said it, it's the perfect excuse for keeping the seven-inch single because every other track on the album was crap. <laughs> this was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't want the 12-inch version because it was just a three-minute song. So it was, the, it was the textbook reason for having a, a seven-inch single as uh, you just want one track of the mm. album. And I think the covers, it's... And that's reminded me, isn't it, is it the Future Heads that did a version of Running Up That Hill? Yes, yeah. Which is, I think, mm. is really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's a good that's example good. because for, for me, if you just do a note perfect impersonation, mm. what's the point? You know, I much prefer someone who takes the genesis of a, of a song and it either adapts it to their own unique style, if they've got a vocal style or whatever, or takes it in a different musical direction. But I've never seen the point of covers albums that just kind of try and impersonate the... I, I think there's a, a bit of a genre apart, which is like the tribute album as opposed to the covers album. Mm -hmm. And I, a, a couple that come to mind are um, Sergeant Pepper Knew My Father back in the 80s, where The Fall did uh, A Day in the Life. Yeah. Um, and I'm your fan, the uh, Len Cohen one, um, All right. which I think this this is pre-digital. Uh, we're sort of seminal in the idea of getting together uh, dif disparate bands to uh, to uh, to do a a, a covered uh, a cover 
piece of work that uh, is in effect a tribute more than just song you know songs we like that sort of thing it's 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 it forms a a more sort of solid whole coherence i'm just thinking like there's there is a question of the whole album but i i have a sort of love of covers in the sense that that at their best they can make you hear a song even if if even if they're trying to to do a fairly accurate uh, copy of the originals um i just i it, i like the way that it makes me hear the original song in a slightly different way you know just slightly yeah. different ears yeah. and then of course the 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 gold dust is that cover that suddenly re completely reinvents yeah, uh, yeah you know Sinead o'connor doing nothing but compares to yeah it. oh wow that, that yeah. but that's, but if you do get somewhere the singers even trying to match the vocal inflections of the singer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're thinking I could just play the original, and um, I, I kind of, but cheating, I, I played a couple of tracks earlier, and then one of them I went and I played the original, and I thought, just to compare the two, and I accidentally didn't go back to the album afterwards, and I wasn't sure whether I was listening to the covers album or the original, <laughs> oh, right, right. so, you know, it's, it's that type of, um, you know. Well, actually, there was the Echo and the Bunnymen recently covered themselves, they released yeah. an album that was yeah. of, of Echo and the Bunnymen songs uh, redone. Re well, there's also, Jeff Lynn just did that with Electro ELO, he did, he did, um, uh, the, the um, well, album Mr. Blue Sky was on, and um, because he, well, for his reason was he didn't think it was produced very well when he did it the first time, yes, but of course, people actually it. prefer the, yeah, the original version, yeah. uh, and the yeah. new version was too shiny and too polished, and you know, yeah. mm -hmm. not the same grit. I agree, mm -hmm. 10538 Overture on that doesn't yeah. quite make it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, an interesting aspect, of course, is that uh, XTC themselves have covered Ella Guru as an yeah. absolute carbon copy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're not doing their own version of it at all, it was, uh, it was almost exactly, yeah, atomic. yeah. Where, whereas sour. the one that completely marmite <laughs> splits people is is their, their cover of All Along the Watchtower, which I think <laughs> is fantastic, but many people uh, detest. Yeah, but and that's, I, that's a textbook example, because to go back to the original, the, the uh, Hendrix version of the Dylan one. Yeah, exactly. Chalk yeah. and cheese. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. And that's a classic example of where I'm coming from, where someone's taken the root. I mean, at times it gets a bit daft, because you think... Well, why have you called this cover version? Because if you didn't use the original lyrics, no one would know it was a cover version. Just, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to pay the copyright to say it's your own song. <laughs> Sometimes it's so radically different that the only thing is perhaps the title of the song you're in there somewhere. But, I'd, uh, I'd be interested to know how this compares to Testimony of Dinner. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which uh, is so uh, the, the first XTC um, uh, tribute album, as it were, many years ago. I don't know quite what... The first mainstream one, because yeah, actually yeah. I, just, well, I just listed yeah. them up because there was the, the fan-driven ones that um, came out of, on cassette oh, only. Of course, yes, Obscene yeah. Collection, Atmosphere to Ocean, Beasts I've Seen, yeah. Sky Lacking, and then Richard Pedretti Allen had... Um, uh, oh, brought together yes. Don't Ring Us, Modern Time Nero's and King for a Day, which mm -hmm. like just his his three alone is 140 tracks. Mm -hmm. There's a huge <laughs> <laughs> there's a huge amount out mm -hmm. there. And I well what, here's an XTC theory that I've got, which is that it seems to me that XTC's music, particularly in the studio years, was uh, is such that the the arrangements and the if you like the the basic structure of the song are inseparable, and so. Quite often, that what happens when people cover an XDC song, they have to cover the they have to cover the inflections yeah. and the arrangements, and the, mm. because it's you can't really pick them apart, and, and it's quite rare to hear to, to, to hear somebody completely reinventing an XDC mm. song. But it's also strange because um, uh, this may be controversial, but I was listening to Easter Theatre again recently, and I that thought, is very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought um, actually the, the sort of hook that the main chorus bit of it is pure Colin in there because it's really it's actually goes back to his earlier popular popular single stuff and you're thinking what's a bit because when you can always tell the XTC which one's a part which one's a Colin Moulding song and um again controversial and um there's a bit where maybe Partridge is thinking well take a bit of this over whether it's conscious or not so you know mm -hmm. Is the effect covering a bit of old XTC himself? Uh, yeah, that's in, interesting. You yeah. know. I think that particular song is an amalgam of two se very separate ideas yeah. that were yeah. knitted together at a later stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, in, in terms of the, the, we, it would be fantastic for us to talk about all forty-nine songs, <laughs> uh, but I think people have got a limited amount of uh, time in their life, and it's already so quarter past eight. It's already quarter past eight, and so I, I, I'm going to suggest maybe half a dozen songs that we can uh, listen to and discuss. And the first one, kind of in keeping in mind uh, what we've been saying about uh, listening with fresh ears about 
uh, to, 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 to interpretations. Um, the first one I'm going to go for is uh, Don't Lose Your Temper, which is uh, Derek Anderson, um, who's working with Michael Simmons, uh, Robbie Rist, Colin Kupka, and uh, produced by Steve Reffling and Derek Anderson. Uh, and this is their version that I think is an interesting take on Don't Lose Your Temper. Don't lose your temper, don't lose your temper. Right, well, um, that was Don't Lose Your Temper by Derek Anderson, and we're all going to pretend that we haven't eaten the pizza in the meantime after, after that, that song was going straight there, and that we're all on top form. <laughs> um, and uh, should, well, David, you said that you had an instant reaction to that, because that's, that's the first time you've heard that song, isn't it? Uh, uh, this, that, this, this version, this, of it, yeah. version, yeah. Um, well, one was that the tempo seemed ab- absolutely perfect. Um, the, mm-hmm. uh, a carbon copy of the original, and the uh, the guitar I thought was very sort of authentic. Um, the tone of the guitar, but um, there were things uh, 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 touches like the brass, uh, backing vocals, um, some nice organ there, um, and the, uh, the, vo- the vocals were uh, softer and. and uh, uh, not so Andy Partridge like, uh, so it's an interesting example there of maybe not taking taking the vocal inflections out of of the mix. Um, I thought by and large successful, but uh, you you could still couldn't help but think the an, a more original yelping vocal uh, <laughs> such as Andy's it still it still tops it. I'm not going to incidentally I'm not going to compare each one with the original. I think that's maybe. It's, it's to, to observe differences. It's always going to lose that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because it's to observe differences, I think. Um, but uh, no, I thought that was uh, very successful. And they haven't tried to do anything especially radical with it, I'd say. I sometimes wonder, like, when, because Don't Lose Your Temper was a B side. Was it T- Towers of London? It was a, it was a, it was a yeah. B side too. And so whenever you come across a song on the B side, uh, I probably wrongly think, oh, well, that's somehow an outtake or somehow, somehow inferior to the, to, the, to the main thing. So Don't Lose Your Temper in, in My Head has always been a, a sort of little secret or something. I don't know, mm, that's something yeah. you, would, you, you would stumble across. It's curious because I mean, the title almost reminds you of the Kate Bush track, um, Be Kind to My Mistakes, which was, I don't a, know that one. It was a track that was intended for um, Hands of Love. Right. But simply because of the vinyl running time, it didn't make it. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of ties in what you were saying about some B-sides are just, oh God, we've got to fill a track, what we do, <laughs> we're going to record this half piece I've got. Some are tracks that were fully intended to go on the album, but just didn't make the grade, yeah, or, just, yeah, or would yeah. have been on the album, but been long enough yeah. in the days before CD. Um, I mean, Be Kind of Master Mistakes, a wonderful track, it's released on the CD reissue, and she said herself that had it been a long enough album, it would have been on there. It's just they had to put it on somewhere. But yeah. that's, I liked, it's, it's, it's it just sounded like people enjoying themselves. It was loose, it was spontaneous, yeah, yeah. it was, mm, yeah. you know, that there was no, uh, as I said before, about it's a song that doesn't have the big grand arrangements, so you could just get into a room and enjoy yourself. Mm, you know, it sounded mm. like a bunch of people saying, let's do a bash it playing this, and there was no side to it. Mm. It was like, are oh, you receiving me in a way? It's that kind of spontaneous, just rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, yeah. Thing, you know. drive. And yeah, then it yeah. seems to me that, like, because I've got that uh, impression, I like Don't Lose Your Temper, but it feels like a, feels like a B side, mm. whereas this version of it, I think, Sounds like an A side. It feels like a you know a Stax, uh, you know, not quite Northern Soul, but you know that mm. that it's the, the, the brass, driven, yeah. driven by, and it's bouncy and it's lively, and you can kind, of, kind of think mm. that, that could have been a hit single. Mm. I wondered at one point whether the bass had been somewhat simplified compared to the original. But uh, the mm-hmm. bass part, yeah, mm. I don't. Um, um, I think I've got the sheet know. music somewhere. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, Mark, I'm wondering whether we should jump through uh, straight ahead because you made a suggestion that you would like us to t- uh, talk yeah, about um, your well, dictionary. Well. Yes. more sophisticated than we realised because Derek Anderson who did um, Don't Lose Your Temper uh, was actually on uh, bass and sleigh bells on that track so it's all, <laughs> all falling very, in, in very nicely um, Mark McCright your dictionary um, his version of the Andy Partridge song also with Jason Burke uh, Scott Mundy um, uh, on, uh, Scott Mundy on drums and Jason Burke on well it's a piano um, Mark why did you want us to discuss this song? well it's got a nice voice Mark McCright and I'm sure he's a lovely person but what's the point? It was note for note, vocal inflection by vocal inflection, same as the original. I mean, there was, there was nothing different about it. I mean, why not just play the original? 
It's an interesting question because the the I, th I think one thing I like about it is that it does feel like a, a real band playing live together. I don't yeah. know that how mm -hmm. they recorded it, but there was a sort of sense of um, uh, that they brought that to it. But they're I, in the same room. Yeah. One of the reasons I like the original, in fact, the whole of Apple Venus uh, mm. Volume One, certainly possibly Volume Two, uh, is that I, I find that uh, Andy Partridge in particular seems to me. Uh, being at his most vocally truthful, if I can use that phrase, seems to me I can actually hear Andy uh, without the mannerisms and so on. That, that there's a there's, there's a the, the, the clarity of his voice. So so uh, and and for such a personal story, uh, song, uh, you you think well why why would anybody else sing that that song? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And um, it was even you know. The, the opening using an acoustic guitar, why not use electric or something just to make it jazz it up a bit. And um, even the way they introduced the dynamics with the original builds, they did their own version. So instead of using a bit of strings or whatever in the original, they brought in the um, keyboard, the organ. Yeah. And I just think, again, it goes back to my point that, you know, to do a cover for something like that, then because it's such a personal song, you've really got to bend it out of shape, you know, to do something radically different and just to do a note for note version sounds like a bit of an impersonation. I mean, it was perfectly pleasant, you know, there's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing wrong with it. I wouldn't rush to switch it off, it's just I didn't see there any great things that you learnt about the original from hearing the cover, which perhaps is one of the rules of it. Mm. I think um, it's, it's probably the most personal of Andy Partridge's songs, I, I can't think of the one that's more personal and uh, heartfelt, and of course it, ha it has that... Uh, Spike in the middle there. It it has a you know you you're you're aware of a, a bitterness all the way through until that final resolution, um, but with somebody else singing it, it it means so much less. Mm -hmm. um, it's like somebody else reading your diary. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, there's a there's a re a remove. There's a detachment there that does make you think. Yeah, I, I thought it was, it was beautifully executed. I, I liked the electric piano, the sound of the drums as well. Really reminded me of uh, uh, Oranges and Lemons era um, snare drum. But um, overall, I, yeah, you you can't help but with all these, uh, and it's, it's it's filled with very clever, intricate puns that that really mean something um, to the singer. Uh, more, probably more than the audience, possibly. Um, you can't help but think, you know, maybe, maybe it's um, it's an exercise and an inter an interesting one, um, but uh, doesn't uh, uh, have the the kind of uh, uh, poignancy of, uh -huh, uh -huh, of the, of the uh -huh. original. But it is interesting. That it's a digital one. It's not the actual CDs themselves. So possibly for that reason. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it was perfectly pleasant. It's just a kind of. For the reasons you explained, it just seems if you're going to do something like that, for I think you should really make an effort to bend out of shape, like I say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's go to one that's uh, I wouldn't say bent out of shape is quite the right <laughs> phrase, but um, it sounds uh, different to, to the one we're used to, and that's Life Begins at the Hop, uh, performed by the Kickstand Band, uh, which is Alison Young on vocals and bass, and Gordon Smith on uh, vocals and guitars. So that was Life Begins at the Hop by the Kickstand Band. If, I think if you told me that that was a hit for Banana Armour in the, in the early <laughs> yes. years, I said, believe it. It's like a parallel universe where, where girl groups were singing these songs that, that were uh, aspirational hits for XTC, but not quite a hit. Um, the, 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 I, I love the, the sort of... Uh, uh, the bubblegum quality of yes, the Yes, of, of the lead vocal in particular. Yeah, I think, yeah. Definitely, yeah. But having yeah. said that, I mean, I remember when it first came out, showing my age, we went around school going, woo, 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 to Is that really? Yeah, yeah. And in this version, the, at times I was thinking, are they actually singing that or am I just remembering it? You know, because mm -hmm, it was so mm -hmm. mixed back in the mix. It was there, though, wasn't and, it? And, yeah. That's, yeah. and that's kind of like the opposite of the last one. It's everything that I, I like in a cover. It's of, it's very much the song, but it's emphasising different bits. So the, the guitar riff was much more to the front. Mm. The woo woos was a mixed way back, and um, it was sufficiently different. It was the same song, but 
it's like the 5.1 versions, you know, it allows you to hear different layers of it that you didn't hear before. Mm -hmm. So the next time you'd hear the XTC version of that, you might pay more attention to the guitar because it was so prominent in that version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought the, the lead vocal emphasised the, the poppiness of the tune. It's a fantastic pop tune. Um, but I think there were a couple of things that maybe rather laboured it. Uh, one is the slow down the tempo, which I thought was interesting to begin with and then realised. <clears throat> maybe halfway through that it was maybe beginning to lose a little bit of momentum yeah, yeah, in the middle yeah. and you, you, you wanted it to maybe speed up after all. Uh, and also the, uh, the uh, heavily distorted echoed guitar. Again, an interesting touch, but I think that uh, ultimately I think that maybe dragged it a little. It, it, it worked against the, the um, fizzy um, female vocal pop sound. It may be, but the, the plus side of that is that there was some fantastic transitions where you were going from lots of fuzzy guitar and then mm. suddenly it goes really quiet again and there was a, it sort of introduces True, dynamic it introduces to it. space and, and uh, XTC themselves were doing this uh, to a good extent in uh, 1981 or so when they were doing a lot of dub reggae in their, uh, in their shows. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember one, uh, one track on uh, their the, um, album from uh, uh, their live album from that year has um, an extended dub reggae. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember yeah. what it is. Would it be yeah. Battery of Brides or something like that? Or was, um, I think, yes, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 I, d I, I liked the distorted stuff at the end, but I think it was because it wasn't forced. It kind of came out of it, so it was yeah. an extension. It could have done, been done really badly. It could have been like his bit, My Bloody Valentine, stuck at the end. Mm. But it wasn't. It was quite, you know, it, it just came out and then faded back in. I mean, yeah. going so back it was, it was judiciously introduced. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it okay, wasn't yeah, yeah. Yeah, a slap like, in the face. Yeah, um, David, did you say that you covered Seagull's Screaming Chris Hercules? We yourself? did, yes. Well, yes. Let's, let's hear Casper, yeah. yeah. sorry, Casca Fandango and his <laughs> tricky sick tears. I'm not going to say this tiny, <laughs> I'm like, I've got this completely wrong. Casper F Fandango and yeah. his tiny sick tears. Um, <laughs> Sing, singing, Seagull, <laughs> singing, singing. Sing. Yeah, that's, he's, just, he's, he's having a laugh. <laughs> it's raining on the beach. She's inches close, but out of reach. Waves look painted on seagulls screaming. Kiss her, kiss her. The sea is warship gray. It whispers food and slides away. Black coastline slumbers on seagulls screaming. Kiss her, kiss her. And so that's uh, Seagull Screaming Kisser Kisser by Casper Fandango. <laughs> And um, something, something, something. Tiny, tiny and you can't do that. Um, I, it, it's purely coincidental that um, David himself has covered this, uh, but if you search for Boy 48 on SoundCloud, uh, you will find songs that don't sound entirely dissimilar to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's an odd coincidence, but I presume, David, that your, your version of Seagull Screaming didn't sound like that. Uh, no, it didn't. It was uh, done with uh, 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 Hugh and Kieran um, as Balloon um, at an XTC convention. And uh, we uh, did it pretty pretty straight. We didn't we didn't have the Chamberlain or Mellotron or what, whatever the lead instrument was uh, in that. But um, uh, we we did it as a, as a regular six eight shuffle. And the very interesting thing about this is that it's uh, um, it's it's been turned into a waltz. And but it interlocks perfectly with the six eight shuffle. Um, it's just the emphasis is, is different and. So you expect the song to actually take twice as long, but it'll probably be around about the same length as the original. Um, uh, three minutes fifty-seven. I can see that. We've right. Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't sound. Yeah. Uh, it's not not over, not over long. The uh, what he's done, I think, is very interesting because uh, apart from musically, he understands the song. I think he also um, has looked at the lyrics and has taken the uh, sea shore analogy and made it into this beautiful synth wash um, with the um, the brush drums as well um, that really I think evokes this kind of seaside thing puts a whole level of romance on it a sort of almost easy listening um, uh, romantic sheen to it um, but uh, that, that's uh, I think it's a he's it's seen another dimension to the song which is uh, um, uh, very interesting and analyzed it and brought out particular qualities that uh, yeah, yeah. Really, really are very affecting and, and, and Mark I'm just kind of thinking what you would what you've already been saying that you know the original song is 
the arrangement is strident. It's, it's sort of yeah. dun, 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 kind of <laughs> uh, the opposite of the sort of easy yeah. listening jazzy sort of feel that he's got. So a bold move. Did you? Is, was it a successful move for you? I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm a sucker for any song that's got a sonar ping in it for a start. So yeah. always, <laughs> yeah. always is a winner for me. But also, I'm halfway through a second glass of a rather nice red wine, and that was doing that very well. It was just a perfect <laughs> case. <laughs> So, so thanks to uh, his little tears for that. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, you know, we we were talking about um, uh, your dictionary, which is a personal song. This is also a personal song. Yeah. So, but 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 he manages to find it, uh, make his his own. I think. I, I would say so. And on that, and on <laughs> that thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Yeah, two thumbs up there. Yeah, yeah. No, I th- I think it's really really lovely. And again, that's one of the ones. This is the thing about this album. Uh, there's a lot of songs that are on the digital only, in addition to the two CDs. But um, there's lots of good, good finds on the digital I, only. I possibly uh, spent too well. much time trying to do anagrams of the artist's name. Well, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, 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 so actually, we'll, we can stick with a with, with a theme here because if we go to Runaways, that was another that was that was another well, song. Several, several, uh, yes, we, yes, we did. Um, and uh, I'd always been impressed by this when. Um, uh, our friend Hugh uh, put this on the stereo and said, Do you, uh, "Guess who this is?" Because I, I I knew XTC from the the hits, the, the Nigel and Generals and Majors and so on, um, but um, this was the first track I'd ever heard from uh, English Settlement, and uh, he said uh, he played it to me and I thought it has a slightly Pink Floyd sensibility to it, but it's it's clearly not them. Uh, and I really just couldn't put my finger on who it was, and I was quite staggered when I was uh, told that it was XTC. Um, and I thought, well, th- th- these these guys are really th- this is this is an interesting album. They're really developing. So um, let's hear what it sounds like when I think like midnight to get their hands on Runaways. That was Runaways, an instrumental version by I Think Like Midnight, who are Andrew Chalfan on guitars and keys, Joe Gennaro on keys, Josh Newman on bass, Dean Sabatino on drums, and Chris Altrius on horns. Um, well, I, I can start with you, David, with exactly the same question. Does it sound like your version of Runaways? <laughs> uh, no, I always had vocals in it. Um, uh, it's the first, this is the first instrumental version I've ever heard of this, uh, and it's interesting what you... Uh, you <laughs> You're obviously not aware of the sort of rather affecting story in the uh, in the in the original lyrics. Um, I think it's not bereft because of it, particularly um, because what I think they've done is that uh, again, rather similar to the last version that we heard, um, they've uh, they've dug into the interesting um, musical resonances. There's there's uh, various sort of dis- dissonances. And chord intervals that uh, come out of Colin's song, and in fact, you could argue that maybe these bring these out better than than the original. Um, <clears throat> with uh, even though Runaways is is basically a it's, it's a fairly fairly straightforward song in many ways. Um, there are some interesting um, musical ticks going from major to minor. There's some um, ninths in it that are interesting. The fifths go in interesting. Uh, directions and I think they they brought those out certainly. Um, I felt maybe we were lacking a bit of heaviness in the drums that we we're used to, of course, from the uh, from the original. Uh, uh, maybe not a bad thing. It, it, it meant that it was a much more um, a, a airborne song than than uh, the the original, which is weighed down by uh, Terry's quite uh, heavy tom tom uh, drumming. I kind of think there's a sort of tension between. Is it is this easy listening that's just going to become uh, elevator music and go into the background? And then mm-hmm. there's something about the horns in particular that have a, a, a kind of jazzy feel that makes me think, oh no, there's actually something quite interesting going on here. Mm, the, the, yeah. It pulls in both directions. Which direction did it pull for you, Mark? Um, again, it went down very well with Grassy Red Wine. Um, <laughs> but no, it's curious because I, I don't think I've ever, ever heard the XTC version out with its place on the album. Mm-hmm. Cause, and it's like you were talking about Pink Floyd earlier. And so in some ways, I mean, not to dimension the song at all. I almost kind of saw it as a bridge between the two songs around it, because it's, a, as you say, it's a fairly simple song. It's, it's 
and the way it fits in and, and it describes this. So that was almost an extension of that. It wasn't such a radical departure for me because it was, it fitted in with the kind of transient, mm -hmm. easy and of course your nice laid back easy thing. It wasn't to grab you by the throat and force you to listen to every word. Well, it was an instrumental, so you couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, should we do a bit of We're All Light, um, Anton Barbo, who is a contrib contributor to uh, What Did You Call That Noise? Uh, and here's, uh, I think, a sort of reasonably straight and, and, and loyal um, but uh, c c convincing version of We're All Light. Don't you know about your fingertips away? There's a universe of atoms that thinks you're real something. Don't you know? Just a couple of lips away Is an evolutionary bean feast Whose insides are jumping Don't you know We're all right Yeah, I read that someplace Don't you know That's um, Anton Barbo on vocals, bass, synths and kettle uh, with Don Hawkins, who's on guitars, drum box, a harmony, vocal. Um, a a Anton, uh, his contribution to what you call that noise, is, he talks about um, Senses Working Overtime, which he describes as a life-changing song and, and effectively the song that turned him into a songwriter. So this is the thing that, yeah. that I want to do. So obviously he's a huge uh, fan. Um, and, and, uh, and as I was saying, I think a very faithful um, and, and loyal tribute, but I think he brings quite a lot of his own self to it as well, would you say? I'd say so, yeah. Um, I think it was an interesting thing, the guitar, which is a kind of, uh, it was maybe uh, detuned de or uh, maybe slowed down or something, had, it had a sort of gravity uh, to it, but a sort of metallic gravity, it was rather similar to what you might hear on Black Sea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, but not on um, Apple Venus too. However, uh, sorry, sorry, what's it? Uh, yes, Apple Venus too, it comes from. Um, but uh, yes, I liked it very much. I liked his uh, lead vocals. They got personality and uh, there's a sort of drawling quality to it, which yes. sort of gives a slightly hippie-ish sort of Yes, feel, sort exactly. Of yeah, yeah, and uh, these uh, lovely sort of wailing backing vocals as well. Um, all contributed nicely. That uh, sort of wobbly synth at the end uh, sort of just tails it off very nicely. Um, yeah, and I, th I think it suits also the lyric content of this uh, sort of rather um, uh, cod philosophy of, of, of we're all light and uh, a received uh, sort of new age puff sort of <laughs> idea. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think he's interpreted it very well. The, yes. the original is, is kind of interesting because it is slightly out of the, out of the regular XTC style, isn't it? Do you think? Uh, yeah. I, I've always thought that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, uh, maybe that maybe the tempo, uh, uh, or or this uh, the, the the use of an occasional sort of that organ stab, ba ba ba. Um, it it was it's slightly sort of um, uh, at odds with um, uh, the XTC that uh, we knew. I think it's a standout track on the on the album for that for that uh, reason. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. This one, yes, I think I think he's he's taken it in a nice direction, definitely. It's interesting because at the beginning of it, I was. Thinking, oh, it was a bit going even going on here, and then you turned to me and said, Bowie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, yeah. And it was that thing, and you know, I'm all for a bit of crooning, and I thought it worked really well on there. You know, it was, it was quite a dense track compared to the other ones we've had. I personally would have cut the last 30 seconds off, that's just been theoretical, mm -hmm. but you know, um, up to that point, I was enjoying it. I think it just dragged on slightly too long, but yeah, slightly denser, but uh, enjoyed the personality coming out of the vocals, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you were saying. Actually, though, I thought, think he does a really great job at the the, 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 the last vocal line yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. exists only at the end of the song. Yeah, there's a couple um, of bits where he's um, not shoehorning the right word, but he kind of crams in the, the lines mm -hmm. a bit because quite dense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, then, and then to finish off with a bit of a crooning swagger at the end, I think you're good on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah he takes some some real ownership there. Mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, without. Again, as I say, without it being because because we were talking before about um, radical interpretations, mm. it's not you, it doesn't frighten no. the horses. If you're familiar with that song, you're not going to yeah. be surprised no. by this interpretation. No. But it feels like he's made it enough. Certainly, it? he can tell, he feels personality in it. You know, he's, he's not hugely just slavishly copying, which mm -hmm. is my thing. You know, he has taken it, hasn't made a huge difference to it, but he's done enough to make it his own. You know, yeah. his version. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we go back in time to go to and go to Battery Brides, uh, which um, has been done by Cinderpop. I don't know who Cinderpop is, but this is Cinderpop. Battery Brides, oh, have you ever tried to break out of your way 
waiting room and find yourself a waiting groom. That's Cinder Pop and Battery Brides channeling Barry Andrews, channeling the, the sort of relentlessness of, of classic um, Terry Chambers drumming uh, to get that sort of, uh, you know, droney kind of compulsive uh, effect. Um, and I think a little bit making it uh, his or her own. Yes, definitely. Uh, the um, I, I liked the what was going on also in the in the sort of lush. Uh, like you say, o over this uh, kind of Raga-like uh, background, there was lots of lovely, uh, very light touches uh, that made it very positive and uh, major key and you know, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I liked also the uh, the frippy guitar, um, right. which was a nice uh, introduction. The vocals, the lead vocals was an interesting one though, wasn't it? Because they were, um, I assumed, rather deliberately understated, um, a little bit sort of detached, like, I don't know, I'm just trying to think, uh, somebody who, um, uh, who, who, who you know, delivers that kind of, well, I don't really care, no, this quite such way. <laughs> yes, maybe, uh, and I was thinking maybe back to the jury, for instance. Uh, right. Um, uh, just, not, I'll, I'll come just about halfway, I'm not going to come any, mm -hmm. any further. And I think that actually is a very much part of the sort of new wave sensibility of, uh, 7980 when the song uh, was uh, uh, first uh, cut. Which is 78. 78, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, a lovely, yeah, nice reminder of, of uh, what a great what a great tune it is. Um, and and it, it has these lovely um, angles that uh, that you can just uh, revel in, but at the same time it goes back to its nice comfort zone. Yes. Uh, Although, the, I'm yeah. just going to think there's a fine line between um, discordancy and is that just out of tune? Is <laughs> yeah, it's yes, true. There's, there's an interesting yeah. bit and a couple of bits which sound deliberate because they haven't mm. been fixed, but but mm. it, it unsettles you when when mm. not everything's jarring together. A bit, or, can you jar together? <laughs> not that everything's fitting together yeah. and maybe jarring. Mm. Um, but the fact that they do this uh, two or three times and they yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. usually means they got it right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any anything to add there, Tim Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I must have been cheated. Um, I thought I recognised the name of the band, so I googled them to see if it was the band yeah. I was thinking of. It wasn't at all. Right. And, it, and it turns out I think there's about five of them. And all right. Up to up to that point, I was like yourself. I was thinking it was remind me of someone like Thomas Lear, Eric Random, you know, around the time, you know, yeah. so yeah. guys that would turn up with a homemade synth that they made out of an electronic magazine plan, <laughs> kind of like Barry Andrews, maybe, you know, and was play on top of a tea chest and do a set with a old drum machine. Mm. So I thought it was just one guy, and also that ties in with the vocals, because, you know, Thomas Lear and were too busy trying to get the machines to work to actually mm. sing. But um, until, of course, the bits you were talking about, the flourishes came in, mm. and then it became a bit slicker. Mm. So much. And I kind of... Um, I, I didn't dislike it for that reason, but I was quite liking the throwback to the early mute electro days that it was mm. kind of bringing up uh, from that respect, which, you know, being a Barry Andrews influence track would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've been we've been lurking. Is that the right word? Uh, quite a lot on the digital only section of the thing. So let's let's finish off uh, back mainstream uh, with my bird performs performed by Myrtle Park's F Fishing Club, uh, which I take to be Kate Stevenson in most respects, uh, who does all other instruments, vocals, arrangement, and production, uh, in addition to John Steele who plays guitars. <laughs> and mix the track on that one um, for Kate Stevenson of Myrtle Park's Fishing uh, Club. Um, that was rather gorgeous, wasn't it? <laughs> it was lovely. Yeah, it had that um, richness and colour to it that uh, the original was. Yeah. Um, I think the uh, the bass was interestingly restrained. You were just the only sort of periodically aware of it. Uh, just uh, came in and out. Um, the, the song has a lot of space to it anyway, um, and she's, she's kept that. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, enjoyed that very much. I was, I was still waiting for a, a, a trumpet solo, Guy Barker, <laughs> Guy Barker on his trumpet. But, uh, uh, but yeah. I was thinking as well, but I said earlier about the idea of XTC's arrangements being part and parcel of the song itself. The diddling ding guitar mm. is still there, even though mm. she's very much made her, the, 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 the song her own, uh, but still respecting that that actually is the foundation, of the, is the base... That is the uh, spine of the of the song. Yeah, and the, interestingly, the guitar is the same sort of tone as, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. as David used. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was it was lovely. It was very nice. It wasn't radically different. It was a shinier version of the original. And that's funny you should mention space because I was going to say exactly the same thing, but from a different angle. Which was, I think, the the, the album, the original album, was the first one that they really treated space as a, another member of the band. You know, there was a lot more mm. uses of space in there to flesh out the songs. It was and. I didn't think, I think that kind of tried to fill those gaps a bit too much. You know, there, was, there wasn't that same mm-hmm. sense of space in it, just to completely disagree with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But, you know, um, but I think space is a key thing in this. It's, it's quite, it's, it's a strange song because it's similar, the original is simultaneously sparse, but quite you know, rich. So it's a tricky thing to pull off and they didn't quite manage it, I don't think, but they made a very perfectly pleasant song mm-hmm. as a result. Mm-hmm. And what do you think? Because what, I guess it's not coincidental that I've chosen this song and Life Begins at the Hop where you've got... A, uh, a female singer and, and obviously with XTC we're used to male voices necessarily and uh, the, the, you, you bring in a, in a female voice and, and it uh, emphasises the melody a lot of the time uh, and, 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 and brings a sort of just another quality that's very inevitably very different to, to, to the ones that we're used to. I think it's, it pays testament to the original songs that not just male female but also to go back to Mr Barbo earlier you could have a crooner you know, mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. and the songs support these different styles, and, and that's partially why I've got to be in my bonnet about them being too literal to the source yeah, material. Yeah. Because as we've seen tonight, you know, the songs do support very different styles of singing or instrumentation, and it just seems a shame not to do that more. So for the people that've done it, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the two female voices we've had have tended to be uh, they're, they're on the sweet side. Um, if you got maybe Patty Smith to do it, it would be mine different. Yeah, yeah. I think my criteria is always. What would Dusty Springfield have made of it? <laughs> As in all life, in all questions. Exactly. Life, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark, did you get a chance to listen to the whole album today? Most of it, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Did, 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 did you have an overall impression of it? I was doing other stuff, so I, I kind of... Um, there was some bits where I think at one point I went back to compare with the original track and I got confused at some point whether I was listening to the album, <laughs> Colors album with the original, mm-hmm. but that was just a, a couple of tracks where they were a bit too literal and I couldn't look it out. Listening to it as we're doing tonight, where we're actually sort of talking about it and paying more attention, I'm definitely getting a much richer feel for it. You know, I'm yeah, appreciating yeah. the songs more. Yeah, it's a fantastic mix of songs as well. If you look at you know, it's from all periods of XTC, and it's uh, yeah, the, the, all of them are among the best. Yes, yeah. it's not an obvious. It's nicely not obvious. I mean, make there's actually a very good. Uh, version of Making Plans for Nigel yeah. which I thought about doing I thought oh surely you can't do Making Plans for <laughs> Nigel um, actually if you look on my uh, YouTube channel there are millions and millions of uh, YouTube uh, covers including uh, I've got in fact a whole playlist which is just covers of, of Making Plans for Nigel I've heard uh, uh, you know more than anybody needs to in, in their life but this is there's, there's a very good one there but um, it doesn't it, it's uh, you know the greatest hits are in there uh, you know, I can see on the on the list in front of us at the moment, dear Ma- Madam Barnum. Uh, uh, actually, there isn't. I don't know if there isn't. The stands is working overtime. I don't think, if, if I, unless I'm unless I'm forgetting it. Uh, but uh, but you know, lots of interesting curiosities, uh, B sides, demos, in fact, as well. Um, say it by by my Colin Moulding, for example. Uh, so lots of interesting choices. And I think, I, I, yeah, I know what you mean, Mark, about um, about some songs being. Um, loyal without without bringing necessarily anything to it but it feels like just playing it through which I've only done I had the chance to do so far a, a couple of times uh, it, 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 it it glides through from song to song yeah. without 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 jarring which that sounds like damning the fake praise it's a major it? achievement I mean there's, there's 49 tracks on there and you know Mr Partridge's vocals are at times idiosyncratic uh-huh. so it can be a real challenge to even replicate them, let alone do something with them yourself. So, you know, hats off to everybody that had a go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they all seem, certainly the ones we've listened to tonight, they've, they've all extracted, I think, uh, an essence there and, and you know, uh, uh, built on it, um, yeah. ex- extended it. They, they've, they've seen what's, they've seen the quality of the song there and, and um, 
um, minded, minded, I would say. Yeah, and it's. I think you know. It is. You can tell that it's a. It is a tribute. It is called an XDC, cele- XDC celebration, and there's a, se- a real sense of hmm. of love and care. Yes, and people absolutely. really doing yeah. something that they want yeah. to do. They're not just. It's not just there for contractual obligations. <laughs> so I'm. I've uh, really enjoyed this conversation. I hope um, you people listening at home have enjoyed it. Uh, there's a little bit more uh, still to come, but in the meantime. Uh, thank you very much, Mark Reed and uh, David White, for joining me, Mark Fisher, uh, for a celebration of an XCC celebration, Garden of Earthly Delights, which is available on Future Man Records via their Bandcamp website. The XTC Podcast. Wouldn't it be good to know what Colin Moulding thinks of all this? Do you think he's in? I think he might be. That man is right on time. Good morning, Colin. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, very good. Thank you very much for doing this. It's very good of you. All right. Before we start talk specifically about my bird performs, assuming you're happy to talk about that one, and I wondered if I could ask you, am I right in thinking that um, XTC in your very early days, like pre-signing, did quite a lot of covers in your set, in your live set. Oh, we're going back a bit. A long way back, yeah. Yes, that's going to take some remembering. We used to do working men's clubs, and so we'd chuck a few in as a few crowd pleasers, you know, when it was particularly hostile. <laughs> you know, and uh, they'd want you to um, take part in the meat raffle and stuff like this. So it was... Um, I think we did Tired of Waiting by the King. I remember doing that one. And because, like, in, in, by, by the time you signed up, you, you still had Fireball X L5 in the set and, and all along the Watchtower. Yes, we did those two, yes, definitely, yeah. So, so they were sort of like over, overhangs from, from an earlier Working Men's Club thing. With Fireball X L5, it was prompted because um, of uh, Barry's Vox Krumar organ. He could do all those kind of whizzy... Uh, organ lines you know from like funfair lines you know so um we kept that in because that was a bit of a crowd pleaser yeah i think i remember doing stay with me the old uh, rod stewart thing or have i got that wrong <laughs> maybe i've got it wrong but um but was it, it, is, it is a way that a lot of people learn to play their instrument is by copying stuff and um i've really only ever known xdc as, as an originals band apart from i suppose you did ella guru later on as well but you know generally an originals band so i don't associate you with doing covers but did is that how you, did, did you learn that way by by copying stuff well you play along to records in order to better yourself at your instrument you know yeah, in those yeah. days, it, the riff was king, you know. I remember playing along to Deep Purple in Rock, because it had lots of riffs on it. Uh, the Groundhogs, Thank Christ for the Bomb. Uh, these were kind of riff bands. And, um, it gave you some feeling of accomplishment to actually do the riff, you know, and get it right. I think that was the earliest feeling I had of, that I've achieved something. And then <laughs> you go on from there, you know. But it's, uh, it's a good starting point. Mm-hmm. It's, it's when your mum catches you kind of freaking out and bursts in on you, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're playing <laughs> along to the record. That's, uh, yes. I, I only know one other uh, feeling of embarrassment in regard to that. <laughs> yes, well, maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> it's not, not at 10 o'clock in the morning anyway. <laughs> and so, so how does it make you feel when, like, it, this is not the first time there's, there's been a fan tribute to, to XTC, but how does it make you feel when, when to know that, in this case, there's 49 tracks, on, on, including the digital downloads on, on the podcast? How, how, how does it feel to, to, for you, just the, the very idea that somebody might be uh, doing one of your songs? Yeah, yeah, it gives you a bit of a kick, of course, you know, the flag and whatnot, you know. I, um, 49, you say? There are, yeah, there's, 40, there's like two CDs which gets up to about, uh, I can't remember, th- uh, 30 or so. Uh, yeah, 32. And, <laughs> and then if you get all the digital down- <laughs> downloads, they just keep on coming. There's a lot of them. Well, it is a, that's a good feeling. You know, somebody wants to, you know, cover your stuff. You know, we'd never, you know, in the early days, there was no sign of that, you know. You know, all these years later when people want to do it, that's, uh, that's a good feeling. Yeah. And then, like, specifically when you hear people covering your stuff does, I, can, I can imagine it just sounds I, I, either might just sound a bit weird because it's not the way that you would have done it or, or, or uh, like if, if they don't do it exactly the way that you've got it in your head do, are you offended by that or inspired by that to hear somebody else doing it a different, different way well I got to listen to the one of Cross Wires Everything is beep, beep. 
I think it's very brave of them to do to do it in an altogether new way. And yeah. Whether the uh, the lyric goes with uh, the music now, I, I would I don't know. I mean, I re- uh, initially wrote that song to irritate. You know? <laughs> yes, and this is a sort of lounge, easy listening version, isn't it? Yeah. No sign of irritation in this uh, <laughs> in this version. No, I mean it's peppered with the devil's harmony in our version. And if you've seen that. Um, thing that's got posted on the web about it being put to tom and jerry oh yes I d- yes that was that was quite good isn't that it? was brilliant and perfectly timed wasn't it It was like brilliantly synchronized it really was yeah i thought jesus christ this is spot on tom is irritating jerry and jerry is irritating tom so uh it was irritation all around yeah so yeah but uh, generally i approve of people doing different versions you know yeah, and that's the the crosswires by the pop-up book. It's it's about as as, as different as you can get, isn't it? And it sort of in that same mould of of um, uh, the the making plans for Nigel that Nouvelle Vague did, where you, where it suddenly becomes this this different uh, sort of thing. Yeah, and the flying lizards doing money, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's 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 all good because they make it their own. You know, I think the drumming on that uh, um, what was it uh, on the crosswires thing was very good. And, it, it's, and it's also amusing as well, because you kind of think that song is not meant to sound like that. <laughs> no, no, that's right. <laughs> They've had that foremost in their mind. <laughs> so that's one, that's one thumbs up from you. And then and My Bird Performs is, is uh, far more loyal and faithful than that, but, it's, but I think she also makes it her own, doesn't she? Yeah, it's kind of nice that a woman is singing it. Uh, a fe- have a female vocalist on the track is... is it's a kind of a different thing. It's, it's that kind of double entendre with my bird performs, you know, like performs, meaning sexually. You, there's always that nod, wink, wink, oh, yeah, my bird performs all right, you know, all this kind of thing. But uh, it's nice to have that kind of... Uh, that dissipates somewhat when there's a lady singing it. Depends which way you're flying, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's true I'm enough. into hot water here, aren't I? Yeah, <laughs> I think with my bird is that, um, obviously, it's missing brass. I initially wrote it, I think, because um, there used to be a um, a TV program on the, televi- on the television. Uh, there's a forerunner to Antiques Roadshow called Going for a Song. And the, on the credits, they had this caged mechanical bird in a cage, a gilded cage, and the, it, it spun round and sang a little tune. I think, ladies and gentlemen from the 1700s, Georgian gentlemen thought that they'd really made it if they owned this thing. It kind of uh, used to sing its tune, and it was like, you know, I've made it, you know, because I've got one of these, you know. We use brass on our kind of version, and that that kind of had that... uh, that kind of pertained to that a lot more. Golden, gilded kind of thing about it. And uh, But it's nice to hear... A lady singing it. That's that's very nice, and the harmonies are terrific. Yeah. The harmonies are fantastic, aren't they? Yeah, terrific. And uh, does um, does it make you think? Oh, it does it make you want to rush back into the studio and think, oh, we could <laughs> we could have done it like this, or, or is it just a question of this thing exists in a in an, in another universe? Well, there's one bit of the song where they actually skip a beat. I, she does do that, yeah. Yeah, they, r- they rush in on the vocal, and it actually I think goes in for one bar, seven and eight, seven eight, I think. So um, I, I thought, primey. Maybe we should have included that, you know, like that. Uh, I hadn't thought, but yeah. I'm glad you noticed that, because I, I noticed it and thought, did, did that just happen? <laughs> Maybe it was an accident and uh, the vocal line jumped in or whatever, but um, I thought, Jesus, is that, that, if that's an accident, that's a happy one. That maybe I could have explored that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. The XTC Podcast. Thank you very much, Colin Moulding. It was great to hear from him. Uh, Also, thank you to Keith Klingensmith of Future Man Records, who provided the music and did the associated interview, uh, which you can read on my blog, which is at XTC Bumper Book of Fun for Boys and Girls dot blogspot dot com. Thanks, of course, to all the brilliant musicians who did such a formidable job on Garden of Earthly Delights, and you can find that uh, record at futuremanrecords.bandcamp.com. Thank you, too, to Mark Reed and David White for the quality chat. I really enjoyed it. You can hear David's music at soundcloud.com forward slash boy hyphen 48, boy 48. And uh, for all your XTC-related reading needs, check out my website at xtclimelight.com where you can order the XTC bumper book of fun for boys and girls and what do you call that noise, an XTC discovery book. See you next time.
Podcast.